and where you're joining us from, we'd like to welcome you to the Crucial Skills for Performance Feedback web seminar today. Um, I'm excited to be joined by our speaker, Ron McMillan. Ron is a New York Times bestselling author of the books Crucial Conversations, Crucial Confrontations, and Influencers. He's also one of the co-founders of Vital Smarts and has spoken to countless audiences and helped multiple Fortune 500 organizations um, with key change initiatives and to become um, more vital and, and better at communication. Uh, by way of housekeeping today, um, I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, the, the duration of this web seminar will be about an hour. Ron will speak uh, for uh, 40 to 45 minutes, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions, and uh, we'll try to take as many of those as, as possible. We, uh, you'll also uh, be able to submit questions through the um, GoToWebinar console, and um, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible, as I said. Um, also, the uh, webinar today will be recorded, um, and so following the event, we will be providing you with a, a copy of this audio recording as well as the slides so that you can uh, discuss them in your teams and organizations. Um, with that, I'm excited to turn it over to Ron McMillan, and I will hand the phone to him now, and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. I'm very excited. It's a beautiful fall day here in the Wasatch Mountains of Utah. Wish you were all here, but I guess this is the next best option. Um, in the spirit of full disclosure, I must admit that the picture on the slide you're looking at is not of me, but my uh, staff thought it was a much better looking figure than I, and that it would be better for marketing to have that instead of me. So that's what you get. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm going to advance the slides, and I think that will advance uh, uh, your slide as well. And I'm looking at a slide that says, facing a performance review. I'm guessing you are, and that's why you're on this uh, webinar. We found that in times when it matters the very most to us are the times that we tend to do our very worst. And performance appraisals have a, a huge load riding on them uh, in terms of relationships as well as outcomes for the individuals in the business. And so I guess we shouldn't be surprised that when it matters most, we often do our worst. And Performance reviews and performance conversations are no exception. And because we tend to do the worst when we're uh, most anxious, um, when we're uh, most emotional, uh, when we're in high-pressure situations, uh, then it seems like performance conversations are ripe for um, uh, emotion, um, not thinking clearly, not using our common sense. Uh, giving way to adult tantrums. In fact, uh, we identify that in, in performance conversations, uh, our experience shows us that people um, have uh, resorted to silent tactics where they refuse to talk about things. We call that simply avoidance. But people also placate. Um, we intimidate. We threaten. We plead. We beg. We bargain, we politic. <laughs> it might be of interest to you to know that our firm did a study of politics, and this is the season for it, I guess. Uh, we found that politics comes from the Latin. Uh, poly means many, and ticks are blood-sucking parasites. So <laughs> I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, don't tell anyone but your friends. Um, we do so poorly in performance uh, reviews and performance conversations because these inevitably are crucial conversations. And uh, we define a crucial conversation as when three factors come together. High stakes, there's really a lot that's riding on this conversation. Uh, opposing opinions, we tend not to agree about elements of our discussion. And those two factors create strong emotion. And of course, it's the strong emotion that causes us to do our worst. Um, and this uh, became so important in our work to help organizations and teams get more effective that we 
launched a major research effort. And in fact, uh, we've got some research just recently completed that's soon to be published in which we found that 85% of workers told by their bosses to improve had no idea what to do in order to improve. You think that's stress producing? <laughs> Here the boss thinks that uh, we've solved a big problem because I've told you what you need to do to improve. The individual walks away with no idea what to do in order to make that improvement. Things don't get better, they just tend to get worse. We also found in the same study, two out of five managers reported that even when they did provide clear feedback and coaching, employees didn't change. So it kind of leaves you with, what's the point? Why are we doing this? Uh, it's an exercise in, in uh, frustration um, and futility. And we're sad to say our research bears out that that is the case for a lot. It seems like of the many types of crucial conversations that we can have in the workplace, uh, one of the toughest is when you evaluate, rate, or critique others. And um, uh, we know that, that we're coworkers and peers, and yet our responsibilities require us to evaluate someone else uh, as if we know much better than they. And um, it creates tremendous pressures in the workplace that can actually lead to worse production rather than improved production, worse performance rather than improved performance. Um, the study, uh, we're just calling it a tongue-in-cheek right now, is the Lake Wobegon study. <laughs> because you all know Lake Wobegon, where everyone's above average. And that seemed to really fit uh, people's view, as we found in this research. Uh, here's the situation that uh, was revealed as uh, we compiled the data. Uh, employees widespread have an unrealistically high opinion of their own performance. They're surprised by negative feedback. They don't believe they get clear feedback on what they should do and believe their boss is holding them back rather than coaching and facilitating their success. Um, let me give you a couple, for instances, that, uh, that define this situation. We found that 84% of employees estimate that their overall performance is in the top half compared to others who hold similar jobs in their organization. When I saw that, I about busted a gut because I had just re read in a nationwide survey uh, reported in the newspaper that 85% of males say they're above average in athletic performance. <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't know if you ever took a statistics class at college, but 85% above average just doesn't quite work. Um, we also found in our research that 45% of employees estimate they are in the top 10% of performance in the organization. Talk about someone's missing some data, huh? 67% have had a boss give them negative feedback they didn't expect, feedback that surprised them. Usually we have a sense of how we're doing and feedback just confirms that. But 67% reported getting strong negative feedback that they didn't expect and that was a total surprise. 87% uh, have had a boss whose poor opinion of their performance kept them from better pay and other opportunities they wanted, as perceived by themselves. Um, this is really bad news when it comes to how effective our performance appraisals and the whole performance conversation process in uh, improving morale, coaching, and helping people to succeed, improving performance. Now, in that same study, we also uh, listened very carefully to managers. And here's the situation the data revealed. Managers have employees who remain stuck at performance levels that are below their potential. And of course, that means organizations are missing a whole lot of productivity, as well as individuals are really frustrated. 50%, 57% of managers say they have employees who are stuck at a performance level that is below their potential. So we're losing out uh, a whole lot um, uh, when, in fact, uh, people could be performing much better as 
uh, viewed by their bosses. 39% of managers say they have employees who remain stuck even after they've given them clear feedback and coaching about what to do to improve. 71% say these employees remain stuck for a few months or longer, so this isn't just an a overnight thing. And 28% say these employees never get unstuck. Never get unstuck. Well, that's a pretty bleak story. Um, later on, uh, uh, we'll give you information about how you can uh, access that study when it's revealed. But for us, we realized um, that that's a bleak picture of this whole tool of performance appraisals, uh, the way it's being used, and the performance conversations that should be go ongoing regular conversations uh, throughout the year. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce uh, a few crucial skills for performance feedback. Uh, these are uh, skills that come from our body of work, including crucial conversations and crucial confrontations. And uh, while uh, there might be, uh, um, last count I had was 21 skills that are frequently used by managers to conduct a performance appraisal. I'm just going to focus on a few that are especially high leverage to set up the conditions for success in that performance appraisal. And I'd like to use a metaphor. Um, it's mountain climbing. Um, if you look at that mountain, isn't that gorgeous? Um, it's, uh, it's awesome how beautiful nature is. But if we're going to climb that, we've got to recognize there are dangers, there are pitfalls. There are also spectacular successes that are possible, but you've got to prepare. You've got to think it through. You've got to gather data. You've got to assemble your, your equipment and, um, and make sure you're, you know who the team is you're climbing with. And that's not unlike having a performance conversation. You've got to prepare in advance. You've got to think it through. What is it that I'm trying to accomplish here, and what is it I'm trying to accomplish with that person? You've also got to gather data. You've got to do your homework and say, what is, are the facts, um, rather than appearances or supposition? And uh, how wise you'd be if you had been having regular work planning and review conversations throughout the year and that the performance appraisal is just documenting the performance and rating that we all understand and agree to, rather than everyone coming tension-filled, wondering uh, how the boss is going to grade them. Well, um, how else do you prepare? I would strongly recommend that the first skill you, con you uh, consider and utilize when preparing for a performance conversation is a little skill we call uh, get your heart right. What that really means is get your motives right before going into the conversation with an individual. What does that mean? Well, it's pretty easy to be disappointed with someone, to be frustrated, uh, to uh, feel that they're not doing what you want them to do or they're doing it with an attitude, and it's pretty easy to have some negative feelings or emotions about someone. And if you carry the motive into a performance conversation that is going to do them harm or be to their disadvantage, I guarantee you this conversation will not go well. If your motive is to be right, to look good, to prove you're good and right and they're bad and wrong, I promise you this will not go well. If your motive is to show who's the smartest, to save face, if your motive is to come out um, with your pride intact as the, the supervisor who uh, sees all and has supervision, um, then I promise you this conversation will not go well. However, if you get your heart right, if you get your motive right before you even open your mouth, before you even look at the other person, then there can be a very different outcome right from the get-go. Here's what you do. You just get a clean sheet of paper, put it in front of you, put the person's name at the top, and write this question, literally write it. 
what do I really want? What do I really want to come out of this performance conversation? And I would really emphasize really, uh, because by that I mean what matters most? What is most important? Now this question, uh, you can supplement it with a host of questions. What results are you trying to get out of this uh, conversation? Um, what, uh, uh, what, what result do you want to come out of the relationship? Um, when this conversation is over, ideally you'd like the relationship to be better because they see that you're coaching and helping them, and you'd like them to be more motivated to do what needs to be done. You would also like to correct them, give them uh, uh, feedback uh, in a way that makes the relationship stronger and leads to better performance. So it's not enough to say, I gotta let them know the truth. It's not enough to say, I'm going to improve performance even if I have to uh, use uh, threats and intimidation. I know that will damage the relationship, but it's what you got to do to get results around here. You've got to look at results and relationship because you can get a short-term spike by threatening someone, but it leads to a longer-term decline as the relationship is ruptured and uh, they they are either unmotivated or try and play gotcha. So on this clean sheet of paper, what do I really want to come out of this performance conversation? Well, I want to be honest. I want to share feedback. I want to make corrections. I want to set in place an improvement plan. I also want to recognize that things gone well. I want to compliment them on the things that they've done to contribute to our efforts. I want to encourage them and help them get a vision of the career that could be theirs. And um, uh, I want things to improve for this person, for the team, and I want them to have an improved uh, uh, satisfaction working here and an improved working relationship with me. When you get all those things clear in your head, you act very different in the performance conversation. In fact, um, um, there's been some interesting studies done by brain physiologists as they try and map the brain using an MRI and giving people tasks then scanning them. And what they found is under conditions of strong emotion, the upper reasoning and logic centers of the brain shut down, the body redirects blood flow to the strong muscle groups, preparing the person for fight or flight. Yeah, literally their brain shut off and now they're ready for fight or flight. Now that's a handy mechanism if you're in the jungle facing a tiger. But if you're having a performance conversation, it's the worst mode possible. This is what pushes us to silence or violence. Our biology programs us to fight or flight, to go silent or uh, to go violent in these high pressure conversations. That's why we've got to override the natural system. Uh, we've got to figure out how to turn the brain back on and the way you do that is you pose questions to the brain. Questions such as, what do I really want? And as your brain focuses on that, that question tells the brain which file cabinet to open. And you open the file cabinet that says, what matters most? And that's where your personal mission is, your personal beliefs, your values, your career goals, your team goals, your aspirations as a leader. And that's the file cabinet you're brain looks in to prepare for this conversation. Now that uh, metaphor I may have stretched a little far, but uh, it's, it's pretty close to how it really works and it's an incredibly practical skill. What do I really want? Get real clear about that before you even open your mouth. Well, you've got your motives right, uh, you've prepared, you've gathered the data and information, you've thought it through. You're ready to have the conversation. Don't start a performance conversation with an accusation. You are a liar. You are lazy. You're no good. We found in our research that that causes people to be defensive. <laughs> you don't look surprised. Um, what was surprising to me is some of us learned in college use an I statement of emotion. I am so disappointed or I am so angry. We found that creates as much defensiveness as an accusation. 
And boy, if you start with something like that that gets the person on the defensive uh, or cause them to draw the sword and prepare for battle, this conversation is not going to go well. Don't start it with conclusions, judgments. Don't play games. Uh, guess what you're best at. Guess what you're worst at. <laughs> if you play games, you'll get games. Uh, don't use traps, leading questions like in a courtroom. Don't try and get them to confess their sin. Um, and don't use hot words. Now, hot word is an emotionally laden word that suggests guilt. So, for example, say, well, I wondered if we could start by talking about your embezzlement. Did anyone notice a hot word in that sentence? <laughs> um, as soon as they hear embezzlement, the alarms go off. Uh, they pull up their shield, draw their sword. They know this is going to be a battle, and you've lost before you've even begun. Well, as you look at that list, have I taken away all, all your tools? <laughs> so what's left? <laughs> well, let's go back to the rock climbing metaphor. Um, a rock climber is on this exposed rock, perhaps a thousand feet above the ground, and it looks really scary, and we assume the rock climber is really brave, which of course the rock climber is. But the rock climber is taking a thought through, carefully prepared for risk. In other words, the rock climber um, will not let his feet leave the floor of the canyon unless he's very, he or she is very confident of their climbing equipment. Uh, they feel safe with their climbing companion. Uh, they feel uh, confident in their, their strategy. Uh, and they won't even take the risk of climbing unless they feel safe about all these things. Then, feeling that they've mitigated the risks and that they're in control, they feel safe enough to start the climb. Similarly, a performance conversation won't go well if the person being evaluated doesn't feel safe. This is probably one of the single most important things we learned in our 12-year uh, uh, study that led to the book Crucial Conversations. In that study, we identified 29 different interpersonal skills that master communicators use. We're looking at uh, what differentiates the best from the rest. Well, of all those 29 skills, we found the single most important thing you can do in a crucial conversation to have success is to make it safe for the other person to talk to you. Now, at first glance, making it safe is not obvious. But as soon as you think about it, it's a truth that you all recognize. You all know this. If I come in to talk to, to Fred, about a performance problem, if Fred doesn't feel safe with me, if he's not sure if I'm here to fix blame or to fix the problem, if, he not, if he's not sure whether or not I'm, I'm here to get him in trouble, then he's very reluctant to disclose. He's very reluctant to share his ideas with me or his opinion. In fact, if he doesn't feel safe with me, when I give him feedback, it feels like criticism, and it stings. And that's when you often get an emotional response. Oh, yeah, well, you're not so good yourself, right? On the other hand, and you all know this, if the person feels safe, if they feel that your intent is to help, not hurt, if they feel you're really trying to help them be successful rather than hold them down and and keep them away from the, the uh, uh, raises, the increases, the opportunities that they're hoping for, if they feel safe with you and are confident that you're trying to help, not hurt, support rather than tear down, they're very willing to disclose. They're very willing to talk about what's on their mind. They're very willing to share their ideas for improvement with you. And similarly, if they feel safe with you, when you give them uh, feedback, it feels to them like caring. It feels like coaching. It feels like you're trying to help, and they'll be very open to the feedback you have to give them. So we found the single most important thing you can do in a performance conversation is make it safe for the other person to talk to you. Now, how do you do that? Well, it's actually not too uh, complicated. 
uh, we found that there are two conditions that make it safe. These conditions, if they're both present, the person feels safe. If they're present to a large degree, the person feels really safe. If they're present to a small degree, the person feels a little safe. If one or more conditions are missing, the person does not feel safe. Those conditions on your screen, mutual purpose and mutual respect. Now, mutual purpose is you know that I care about your goals. It might not be that our goals are the same, but in fact, our goals are compatible, and that I know you care about me achieving mine. That creates mutual purpose, and mutual purpose goes a long way to helping a person feel safe with you. We call it the entrance condition. You can enter into dialogue if you have mutual purpose. The continuance condition is mutual respect. Respect. In fact, wherever you are, let's all sing about that together. R-A-S-P-E-C-T. Paul, don't they sing a lot? I don't hear anybody. Oh, they're muted. Okay, well, we don't have to sing together. Mutual respect is you know I care enough about you to be respectful of you. Um, mutual respect means that even, even, in, um, even in a tough situation where the other person's not being respectful to me, if I choose to respond with respect, then it's amazing how quickly the other person calms down. It's amazing how quickly we can get back to a dialogue and um, and I've seen this happen in, in amazing situations. Um, in fact, I was in a, a negotiation between management and union with over a billion dollars of pay and benefits on the table being negotiated. A billion dollars at stake. We call that high stakes. And right in the middle of this negotiation, one of the vice presidents insulted one of the union leaders. And he just looked at him, closed his papers, gathered his books, stood up, and said, I don't have to take that from you. And then he walked out of the room, and all the union walked out of the room, leaving a billion dollars yet to be negotiated on the table, because at that moment in time, the way they were being treated was more important to them than the money on the table. This respect is a big thing. It's an important thing. And so your goal throughout the performance conversation is to make it safe for the other person, to emphasize what the mutual purpose is, and to be respectful throughout, not sarcastic, not demeaning, not rolling the eyes and recalling uh, one of their failures, but in fact being showing them that you care enough about them to be respectful. Now, with safety in mind, there's a simple skill that helps you develop that safety. It helps you to create it at the very beginning. We call the skill share your good intentions. Um, and it's amazing how easy this, sim this skill is to use and what an impact it has. Um, now, Joseph Grenny and Al Switzer will argue with me about who discovered this, but it was really me. Um, I. Uh, had a, a position in, in my uh, community where I uh, was the leader of um, about uh, 40 teenagers. And, uh, and they got to know me pretty well. I got to know them. We had some good times together. And uh, one night, about 10 o'clock, I got a call from one of these kids. He said, uh, hey, uh, Ron. He goes, yeah. And he goes, you awake? And I go, yeah. And he goes, uh, my uh, dad wants to talk to you. I go, hmm, this is curious. Dad comes on the line and says, hey, Ron, how you doing? I go, fine. He goes, uh, hey, uh, we're having a little uh, one of those, what do you call them, critical conversations, and uh, wondered if you could come help us out. And I said, help you out? And he goes, yeah, you know, like uh, facilitate uh, us. And I said, who's us? And he says, me, my wife, and, uh, and uh, Jeffrey. And I said, well, you know, I'm not a, a family counselor or a therapist. Uh, and he says, well, he says, we're sure not doing very well. I'm thinking anything will help. 
<laughs> so I said, okay. So I, I went down to their house. Uh, uh, they invited me in. Dad was sitting at one end of the table, Mom at the other, um, their son in the, the middle, and they gave me the, offer, the open seat at the other end. I sat down and said, so uh, what's going on? And the dad looked at me and he goes, our son here, and I can't remember if I used his right name, but I wanted to disguise it, so we're going to call him Jeremy. <laughs> he said, our son Jeremy, um, he, as you know, is in high school, his senior year, he's 17, and uh, all of his friends are 18 and at the, the local uh, community college. And they have an opening in their house, and they invited him to come live with them and finish out a senior year uh, living with these college kids. And then he turned to Jeremy and he says, which is a horrible idea, and we're not going to let him do it. And then he turned back to me and said, and Jeremy doesn't like this idea. And uh, Jeremy says, you know, he says, you treat me like I'm 12 years old. I'm not. I'm a high school senior, and boy, they got right into it. And I was trying to think, well, how do I help in this situation? I was thinking, let's see, mutual purpose. What's the mutual purpose? And right then, Jeremy's dad just stopped mid-sentence. And he looked down on the table, at the table, put his hands flat on the table, took a deep breath, looked at Jeremy. He said, Jeremy, I'm not trying to control you. I'm not trying to make your life miserable. He said, I'm just scared. I'm frightened what can happen to a 17-year-old sitting in the college crowd. He said, Jeremy, I love you, and that's what this is all about, your safety. And Jeremy teared up. And Jeremy couldn't say anything for several moments. He said, Dad, I, I know that. I know that. And his dad said, let's figure something out here. He said, let's figure out some way that you can be happy and I can feel both responsible for your safety and, and safeguarded. And they took about 15 minutes to work out that Jeremy was going to finish living at home his senior year. Dad was going to loosen up some of the, the controls. And they'd talk uh, frequently about how it's going. I walked home and said, so, I just saw something pretty special. I, of course, had nothing to do with it. But what I saw Jeremy's dad do is this little skill called share your good intentions. What you do is you simply tell the person your intention toward them and toward the performance conversation. Um, this skill of share the good intention creates mutual purpose. It demonstrates immense respect for the other person. And it creates a lot of safety very quickly. How do you know what your good intentions are? Well, go back to that sheet of paper you wrote on when you said, what do I really want? Literally, you can read your answer to that person, and that's sharing your good intention. Um, so now, you've got your heart right. You know what you really want for the person and for the results. You open by sharing your good intention that in fact you want what's best for them, you want to help them in the career, you also want the team to succeed, and you want them uh, to get the, the job done in a, at an excellent level. Now you simply describe the gap. The gap is the difference between what was expected of the other person's performance and what actually happened. Now often, uh, if you could think of it as the black arrow is expected performance. We kind of expect people to, to continue to improve. The red dotted line is actual performance. And over time, it's a little bit above, a little bit below, no problem. Here's the principle. Never let a significant gap develop between actual performance and expected performance without having a crucial conversation. If there's a significant gap above the line, Never let time pass without sitting that person down and saying, thank you for an outstanding contribution to our team. I really appreciate it. Acknowledge it and thank them. Similarly, never let a significant gap below the line occur without sitting down and having a performance conversation. Um, the gap then is a significant 
difference between actual performance and expected. Uh, in a performance conversation, it can be above the line in which they deserve praise or below the line in which you have a problem to solve. The skill is very simple. Describe the gap. Factually describe what actually happened and compare it with what's expected. You don't judge the person. You don't berate them. Say, hey, Fred, I wanted to talk to you. I was looking on the report and I noticed that you've been late, at least 30 minutes late, for four Mondays in a row. As you know, you're expected to be here on time at your station every Monday. And so I wonder what's going on here. That becomes the question, the why. Uh, the gap uh, factually describes what happened compared to what's expected. And that sets the agenda. That tells them what we're talking about. And it doesn't include any uh, judgments or accusations. It's probably the least defensive way you can introduce a problem. Describe the gap, simple skill. Now remember, you factually describe what happened. That's why you've got to, to know what the facts are. And remember, facts are behaviors and occurrences. They're observable, quantifiable. They're not judgments. They're not hearsay. Um, in fact, I strongly believe gathering the facts is the homework required to have a performance conversation. If you haven't gathered the data, if you don't know the facts, then you're in a fuzzy, vague area that makes it very hard to give specific feedback and problem solve. Factually describe what's happened. And remember, no conclusions, no judgments, no absolutes. What's an absolute? Um, you know, I, I'm so bad at absolutes, and I've really been working on it. An absolute is, you're always late. You're never on time. And the teenager says, yes, I am. And I say, no, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Do you remember December 17th? I was on time then. You know, is that the conversation you want to be having? I don't think so. So no absolutes, um, but rather factually describe what happened, compare it with what's expected. Now, as you say why and listen, it could be they respond with, well, I didn't know that's what was expected. Well, that's an easy problem to solve, clarify expectations. It could be they say, is it really that important? I go, oh, this is a motivation problem. Now we've got to work on motivation, help them understand consequences natural consequences that occur when they, they're not on time. Or they say, you know, I, I gave it my best effort and I couldn't do it. You realize, oh, this is an ability problem. Um, what's the ability problem? What's getting in the way? And now let's problem solve together. So it gives you a way of thinking about problems, a way of getting started, keeping defenses uh, down, um, making things uh, safe. If we go back to uh, that uh, research uh, study that I, I mentioned, 37% of employees say that their boss did not know what he or she wanted them to improve. Over a third said that the boss wants them to improve but doesn't even know what they want. When we ask bosses about that, only 1% of bosses say they didn't know what they wanted the employee to improve. So there's a huge disconnect here. Um, this is the opportunity to clarify expectations, to create a plan to close the gap. Now you're, you're making progress. Now you're working on solutions rather than wasting energy and emotion spinning around and arguing. This is the time to dialogue. We simply describe dialogue as the most efficient, effective method of communication. It's uh, a simple way of this, defining it is free flow, free flow of meaning. I put my meaning out, you put your meaning out, we look at what we've got, uh, we uh, talk through options and choices, we make decisions, we move on. Very efficient, very effective. Most of the labor in communication and the time in communication comes when we're playing these dance games, when we're trying to guess or anticipate what the other person's thinking or what they want or we're trying to maneuver them. We found the number one 
barrier to free flow of meaning is fear. I'm afraid about what you'll do with the information if I were to be honest and direct. And that fear is what pushes us into the silence and violence uh, scenarios. And so by making it safe and overcoming the, the fear, uh, you open up uh, the free flow of meaning, and that's dialogue. So remember, what we've just been talking about is describe the gap. Um, you uh, uh, came in today at 8.20. The job requires you to be here at 8. What's going on? The what's going on is the question that invites them to respond, and now you listen. You don't preach, you listen. You don't debate, you listen. And then you invite dialogue. And now we're talking about it, now we're solving problems. Um, let's see, couldn't get my slide to advance, how's that? Let's summarize. Uh, when you're re going to have a uh, performance conversation, the first skill to use is to get your motives right. You sit down with a sheet of paper, say, what do I really want for the relationship and for the results? Get your head right. Gather the facts. Make sure you're operating out of what happened. Facts tend not to be subjects of argument where interpretations, judgments, opinions do. Get the facts right, and now you're ready to go to work. Um, <clears throat> the next thing is make it safe, and a wonderful skill to make it safe, which is a way of creating mutual purpose and mutual respect, is share your good intentions. And how do you know what your good intentions are? You just wrote them down on the sheet of paper when you put what you really wanted, and you share that with the other person. You then describe the gap. Actually compare what happened with what you expected. The sequence doesn't matter. Compare what you expected with what you observed. Describe what you observed. Compare it with what you expected. Doesn't matter. Then end with a question. Why? What's going on? Help me understand. Why did this happen? Why wasn't this uh, uh, level of performance achieved? You listen, and now you're in dialogue. Now you've set up the conditions for a very effective a performance conversation that helps avoid a whole lot of the problems we saw in our research, a whole lot of the dissatisfaction and upset that was revealed by that data. Well, that's what I wanted to share with you, and I'd now like to open it up for questions and answers. Um, uh, I certainly don't know everything there is to know about this subject, but I know an awful lot about what we've studied. And so I'll turn the time over to Paul to uh, facilitate it. Thanks, Ron. I, I know that uh, as we get ready for uh, performance review season here for a lot of folks, um, I probably would echo the audience in saying that uh, uh, it would be nice if we were all going into performance reviews with somebody who had these skills. And uh, I wish I was uh, going into a performance review with you now, even though I don't report to you. Uh, I just, just want to come in and, and talk about stuff. So anyway, uh, we do have a couple, of, a couple of minutes for questions, and so I would just encourage you to submit those through the GoToWebinar console if you haven't already. Um, Ron, I'll just kind of tee these up here and, um, and let you just kind of answer them. I've kind of summarized them uh, into common themes or buckets, but um, uh, here's, a, here's kind of a common one. To, um, uh, even when I do a good job with constructive feedback and performance reviews, when I come to the next performance review and expectations aren't met, that's when I seem to struggle with it's when I have to hold people accountable. I think I'm good at setting expectations, but then when I have to go back and review them, um, that's when I seem to struggle. Any tips? Boy, that's a real familiar problem. Um, let me give you two suggestions that I've seen be very helpful. The first is once you've set clear expectations, um, uh, there's a little skill called move to action. Uh, it's a principle called move to action, and the skill is uh, document who does what by when and follow up. Document who does what by when and follow up. So what I do is having set clear expectations, say, now you're going to do this, I'm going to do that. Let me write it right here uh, or enter it in my iPad, um, and then let's you and I get together on Friday and talk about how it's going. 
Now, with someone who you have concerns about whether or not they'll follow through and perform as expected, then set the, the, the follow-up date sooner than you otherwise would have so you can see what progress they're making and you can save a project. Uh, this is a way of help, helping to assure success is it might be you have frequent follow-ups in the early going to make sure they're on track and doing what you wanted and then less frequent follow-ups and then in that way you kind of guide them right to the success and you can celebrate together. That's a lot different than hoping in six months they'll perform and then biting my nails and holding my breath and six months later, ah, they let me down. They didn't do it. So frequent uh, accountability with those that you have concerns with and that also is of course a coaching opportunity where you can educate them and help them and make suggestions. And then uh, being very clear about who does what by when, when the follow-up is, and then following up as you agree to. Uh, that can help a lot in that. And that, of course, is a different approach. We call it a work planning and review uh, uh, conversation. And you have them ongoing throughout the year. And then when you sit down for the performance appraisal, there are no surprises. We all know how we're doing. And uh, it tends to be just uh, a routine matter of documenting what's happened and, uh, and shaking each other's hand and getting on to the next uh, year rather than fretting and stewing and fussing and having all the uh, drama. Right. Here's another one. This kind of takes a unique approach. I like this, this question. It says, a lot of what we've talked about today is from the perspective of if I'm a manager, how do I deliver the feedback? But if I'm not a manager and I'm the one that's receiving the feedback, even though you've talked about a few of those skills, how can I essentially train my manager or discuss the way my manager should deliver the feedback without offending? What a great question. Um, the best way, of course, is start your own company and be the boss. You know, Then you don't have to put up with anyone telling you what to do. But if you can't do that or you've got the plan to do it but not ready to, to pull the trigger, um, uh, it's actually easier than you'd suspect. Um, and what you do is you remember that the key to having a crucial conversation go well is make it safe. We even have to make it safe for our boss uh, to give us feedback and talk to us. Can you believe that? And so you uh, set a time to sit down with uh, your leader and uh, you uh, share your good intention. Say, um, I really want to talk to you about how I'm doing. I want to get uh, uh, feedback. I want to know if you're noticing the good things. I want to know if you have suggestions about how to improve and do better. And um, my intent is by getting your, your feedback and help, uh, I can improve. What I really want is I want to do the best job that can be done in this position, and I want to help the team accomplish its goals, and I want to help you reach your goals. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement of mutual purpose. And uh, a boss who doesn't respond to that by, well, let me help you reach my goals, <laughs> is uh, crazy, I'd say. Having established that mutual purpose, the trick is often that the feedback we get is vague and not very helpful. Um, well, you need to uh, show more engagement. You go, hmm, that's not very helpful. And so often, the way you turn vague, unhelpful feedback into very helpful feedback is just a series of questions to get more and more specific. Um, Bosh, you say that I'm not as engaged as you'd like. Um, can you give me an example? When did that recently happen? Uh, if I was engaged as you would like, what would I be doing differently? What would I be doing more of? What would I be do, doing less of? How would you know it? Um, and so you ask a series of questions not defending yourself, you're not in a court of law, but to clarify, to get more information about what the boss means uh, by that. Now the worst answer a boss can give you is, well, I don't know, I, I'll know it when I see it. Okay? Then what you do is you use that little trick we talked about earlier where you have frequent accountability. Say, okay, well, I'm going to specifically work on engagement this whole week. And in fact, I'm going to come back tomorrow and I'm going to give you a plan what I'm going to do to be to show more engagement. 
and then I want to check with you every two days, and you let me know, am I doing it? Am I doing it? Am I, am I approximating it? And uh, as the boss goes, yeah, more of that. That's good. I like that. That's helping. Then you know you're on track. You know you're headed in the right directions, and then less frequent accountability. Now, I uh, was being a little facetious by uh, um, how you'd handle that, but the principle is very much there. Um, share your good intention with your boss. Uh, ask for the feedback. Show how you want what the boss wants. You care about the boss's purposes. And then get it as specific as you can and have opportunities to talk about it so you can check your progress. Awesome. I've seen Ron actually do this very, very well firsthand, so it, it definitely works. Looks like we have time for just one more question, Ron. Um, uh, a lot of this, uh, throughout the presentation, you mentioned having conversations regularly, but do you have a recommendation or a best practice as far as the formal review process is concerned? I've seen it at companies where it's actually monthly, which is a nightmare because everything is has to be documented, all the way up to the annual ambush, which uh, is also uh, just as detrimental without having conversations uh, throughout the way. Is there a uh, kind of a best practice as far as how often to have a quote unquote formal review outside of the crucial conversations? <laughs> Annual ambush. <laughs> That's great. That could be a title of a book. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, uh, the recommendation I have is a real common sense recommendation. But I'm constantly amazed at how uncommon common sense is in uh, business. And it's simple this, simply this. Uh, think of loose tight, loose tight. Uh, rather, tight loose. That would be a better way to describe it. And think of a series of work planning and review conversations. The work planning is what are we going to do next, and the work review is how's it gone. Uh, so we sit down, we review. Are we accomplishing what we wanted? Are you doing what you agreed to? Am I giving you the support and help? Uh, uh, any modifications are needed? OK, what's the plan going forward? When will we reconvene and, and discuss it? And between now and then, uh, we'll manage by exception. If something comes up, we'll get together. Um, you let me know so there are no surprises. If I'm aware of something that affects your plans, then I'll seek you out. We'll sit down. That's a pretty easy way to do it. Then what you do is when you're starting off, the relationship's new, or if someone's unproven, you have those frequent work planning and review conversations. In the process of the review, you give them feedback. You give them suggestions. You give them coaching. Uh, you brainstorm other possibilities. You listen to their ideas. Um, act on some, and those you turn down, you explain why. Now what's happening is we're getting in a rhythm. We're getting to understand each other. We're helping each other get to where we want to go. And now as things are going smooth, have those less frequently. Uh, if things aren't get rocky, tighten them up. Have them more frequently. If uh, things are going really well, get loose about it and have them uh, less and less frequently. Uh, I've seen mature uh, uh, performers at Bell Laboratories that have work planning and review probably about once every six months, and uh, then an occasional email. But they're off doing what they do, and uh, and the manager's pleased with what's happening. And so why why uh, uh, turn their attention off their work and make them go through a formality? You know, it doesn't make sense. I've also seen examples where uh, someone's being coached and mentored into a new, very difficult position of responsibility they've never handled before. And it was daily work planning and review, feedback, uh, make our, our next plans, get back together tomorrow. And then as they succeed, then you make it uh, less and less. And then the performance appraisal is just uh, uh, some paperwork, no surprises. Everyone knows where we are and what we're doing. Great. Thanks again, Ron. It's been very, very informative today. Um, I know I've learned a few things, and even though I work here, I always am amazed at, at uh, what a great refresher some of these skills can be. Um, just to wrap up, um, I just want to let you know, um, you know, we're not going to leave you hanging here. We want you to be able to start to work on these skills. So uh, here's a couple of resources that we will be sending out in a post-event email with links to all these things. Some of you may be familiar with some of these already um, and, and, in fact, use them. 
Um, we have our style under stress assessment. This is basically a personal assessment that will help you discover how well you handle crucial conversations. As Ron mentioned, um, one of the most stressful conversations that we can have is uh, related to performance feedback. So this can help you prep prior to going in. Um, Ron also alluded to our Lake Wobegon study. Once the, those uh, results are published and more data is available, we will, uh, we will send you those findings. Um, and uh, if nothing else, you'll, you'll feel better about the way you handle them because you're, you're, uh, you're probably in the minority if you know any of these skills and are able to do them effectively. Um, we also have our Crucial Skills newsletter. Some of you may already subscribe to this. If not, uh, we encourage you to do so. It's a free weekly email with useful tips and resources and insights on, on multiple, multiple topics, not just performance feedback, but um, how to use these skills that Ron talked about. As I mentioned at the top of the hour, we'll also be providing you with the audio recording of this webinar as well as the slide presentation for you to share with your teams and discuss and, and, um, and review um, so that you can uh, you know, enhance those skills. Again, those will come in a post-event email probably within the next couple of days once we've archived the uh, recording today. Last but not least, um, we also uh, at Vital Smarts have ways to become more skilled. Ron certainly mentioned a few of the skills, but there are a multitude of skills um, that you can learn to become a better and more effective communicator. Um, one of those is to attend one of our public workshops. We have these all over the country. Perhaps many of you have, have attended one already. Our calendar of events has already been updated for all of 2011. So we encourage you to go out to that link, um, vitalsmarts.com, public workshops, and see what's available in your area. We also have a trainer certification option. So um, not only can you attend the two-day, but if you want to get certified to be able to train these skills in your own organization, we offer that option as well. Um, we offer in-house training. So somebody, uh, a master trainer, um, somebody that Ron himself has trained can come out and deliver you uh, deliver some similar training to your organization and tailor it to your specific needs at a location that works for you. And last but not least, um, a lot of you may be thinking, oh, this is great stuff, but how can I get buy-in with my senior leaders for this type of training? We really need this here. Well, one of the ways is to get somebody like Ron to come out and speak to their, your executive team um, and, and highlight some of these problems that organizations face and how they can solve them. And you can get more information at our Speakers Bureau website there on your screen. So, Again, we're at the top of the hour. Um, I want to thank Ron for today's presentation, and I uh, hope you found it enjoyable and informative. I know I did. And uh, again, be on the lookout for the follow-up resources in the next couple of days. Um, we appreciate all those that were attend that attended today, and for the uh, the questions that you submitted. And uh, we look forward to talking with you soon. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and sign off for now, and wish you the best as you uh, get ready to. Uh, conduct your performance reviews for the rest of the year. Thanks and have a great day.